Hello, I'm Michael Cantrell, and you are listening to the Prison Officer Podcast, a place to have a conversation about the forgotten cops that work in this country's jails, prisons, and correctional centers. A place for me to try to make sense of a career spent working inside the fence with some of the greatest people that nobody sees or recognizes for the important job they do to keep this world safe. If you love this podcast, hit the follow button, or better yet, share with your family, friends, or coworkers. In more than 28 years of corrections, I have used or supervised Pepperball hundreds of times. Now, as a master instructor for Pepperball, I teach others about the versatility and effectiveness of this Pepperball system. From cell extractions to disturbances on the rec yard, Pepperball is the first option in my correctional toolbox. One of the most dangerous times for officers is during cell extractions. Pepperball allows officers to respond with the lowest level of force and still be effective and ready if the situation escalates. The responding officer controls where the projectiles are aimed, how many projectiles are launched, and how rapidly they're deployed. This allows the response to be tailored to the moment. To learn more about Pepperball, go to www.pepperball.com or click the link below in the show's information guide. Pepperball is the safer option first. Well, hello and welcome back to the Prison Officer Podcast. My name is Mike Cantrell and today I've got a, a really special guest. He's a, he's an author and a law enforcement officer for many years and I'm going to go to his bio here in the book. Uh, Michael Laidler has worked in law enforcement for nearly two decades. He served with distinction in numerous positions and leadership roles, from police officer, border patrol agent, to federal corrections officer. Michael's dedication to service shines in all he does. He holds an MBA from Moorhead State University and a BA from Florida State University. He's also a distinguished Toastmaster. For those of you that don't know what that is, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, Michael has transitioned his career into training and educating law enforcement officers nationwide. He's highly sought after as a keynote speaker and facilitator, and Michael's methods continue inspiring and developing authors to become better and in every regard, especially personally. It is his goal to impart the necessary personal development skills for officers to operate at full capacity in every situation. Uh, welcome to the Prison Officer Podcast, Michael. Good morning, Mike. I'm so excited to be here. You know, I don't get too many opportunities to speak on podcasts that are related to corrections. It's And it's simply because corrections isn't always the sexiest, so to speak, industry. Law enforcement is not sexy in general. And then you have corrections that's not as sexy. So I'm excited to be on your podcast. I've been looking at it for about a year, year and a half. And I was, obviously, as we've connected, it's allowed me to get more more involved in your particular podcast. So I'm excited to be here. Let, let, let's get this party started. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I've been following you too. And um, uh, how you're out there speaking and, and we're going to talk about your book today. But uh, I always like to start at the beginning, you know, and uh, I like to find out, um, you know, where people came from and what got them interested in law enforcement or corrections. And I think you've got a, a very unique story with that. So tell us where you grew up and, you know, what got you started in this profession? Well, for me, I grew up in Miami, Florida. A lot of people don't see it, but they could probably hear it if they hear how fast I talk. I, I've learned how to speak a lot slower because in Miami, it's always rapid, rapid, rapid speaking. If you're not speaking quick, if you're not hustling, if you're not moving with the purpose, it's easy to get lost in the mix. I was born and raised in Miami to a single mother and my grandmother raised me. And my start in law enforcement was actually kind of unique because there was something that happened in 1994 as far as criminal justice law enforcement went. And it was actually an incident mm -hmm. in California. So for the viewers, as you start thinking about it, think about June of 1994 in California. There was something that was really exciting that was going on. Think about it for a second. Mm -hmm. All right. If you don't remember, <laughs> let, me, let me tell you guys. There was this chase with this white Bronco. Are we starting to kind of realize where I'm going with this? Well, mm -hmm. if you're if you're born after 2000, you probably don't know. But if you were alive at any point in the 90s, you definitely know about this case. It was the O.J. Simpson chase that eventually turned into the, tri the trial. For me, I was nine years old at the time, and I can remember being glued to that TV. And when I say glued, like... Like, I don't remember using the bathroom. That's how much I was into this. My family, <laughs> we were watching the chase. We were watching the investigation. Then we started watching the trial. And 
from that point forward, I remember telling myself and my family that I wanted to be a homicide detective in LA. And that's what started my drive. It was just everything about the 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 weapon, the gloves don't fit, you must have quit. Everything you can think of is <laughs> it, it just got me into law enforcement. Right. Wow. I don't know that I've interviewed very many people that have that specific moment where they decided that's where I want to go. So um, after that point, you decided this is where I'm headed. Where did life take you for the, uh, you know, through high school, college? Absolutely. I, you went to college. So tell me about that. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That's definitely what happened on my side. From that point, as I continue to build my education in law enforcement in high school, I went to a magnet type school that allowed me to take criminal justice classes. I went to a community college during that time, did something called dual enrollment. So even that point, I was starting to enroll in criminal justice classes. When I left high school, well, when I graduated, I just leave. But when I graduated mm -hmm. high school, I ended up going to Florida <laughs> State University. And my initial degree, my initial concentration was in criminal justice. And as I continued to progress, I was actually fortunate enough that it led me to my first career in law enforcement, which was a police officer for Tallahassee Police. And that was at the the nice, ripe age of 19. So for me, I've been in law enforcement since I was 19, and that led me to different industries in law enforcement as far as obviously being a police officer, a Border Patrol agent, and then for the past 10 years, um, federal corrections. Okay. So when you started with the police department down there in Florida, um, how were some of those first months, that first year? Was it what you expected? Did, what did you learn from, you know, that experience and, and becoming that police officer? You finally reached your goal. So were you happy with your goal? It, it's funny because as I've reflected on my life, I was very happy at the time that I was given an opportunity to be a police officer so early. Now, it wasn't in L.A., and it wasn't being a homicide detective right out the gate. <laughs> However, it did feed that initial hunger to get in law enforcement. Being a police officer, being in a uniform, being on the streets taught me so many things as a young man. It taught me to be an adult a lot quicker. It taught me that I had to make decisions a lot faster. And I had to make decisions for people very quickly. I do believe a lot of my decision-making skills that I have now was cultivated back when I was at that age. So for me, it did really grow myself to, or it did grow me to being that, that more well-rounded person that could make decisions and allowed me to grow in that manner. So for me, yes, it was good. But I think when I got the position, as I look back now, because of some of my upbringing and that upbringing mean growing up in, in poverty, there's times when we didn't have a place to stay. I slept on couches, lived out of trash bags, didn't have electricity. Ramen noodles was the meal back then. For me, getting in law enforcement and getting a job, it kind of put me a little bit on relax mode. And for all those out there that don't understand what I mean, it put me in a mindset to where I felt like I had made it. And it wasn't forcing me to, to, to have a great drive like I have today. And it didn't really take me, it took me a while to kind of realize that having this career was going to slow me down. I just didn't know. So for me, it definitely was fulfilling in a sense of I got into law enforcement, but it also kind of slowed down my overall growth because I think it, it made me, it didn't really help build me to keep pushing myself extremely hard, but I loved it. I loved being a police officer. I think about it sometimes right now, like, hey, should I go back and being a police officer? Should I, should I go be like, be like a chief of police or something like that? But then I look at the news and I'm mm -hmm. like, eh, this isn't the great, greatest idea, so I'm just not going to do this yet. <laughs> so for me, starting off early, starting off young, and getting into law enforcement early definitely satisfied at least one part of my dream. Absolutely. Um, since I've retired, I've thought that a couple of times. Uh, should I go back and maybe I could become a reserve deputy or, you know, something like that. And, uh, and then I wake up in the morning and it takes me three times to stand up and I realize how bad I've been to my body over the years. And, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so yep. I might not be good at chasing bad guys anymore, <laughs> but, uh, um, so how many years did you do that? For me, I was a police officer for four years, a little over four years. Okay. Yep. 
And then what was your next step? Then I, I had this burning desire to get into the federal government. And I initially applied for the FBI. And for those that have tried to apply for the FBI or considering it, although I had a bachelor's degree when I applied, me having just a bachelor's degree and being a police officer wasn't what the FBI was looking for. And I don't, to this day, um, they still have a pretty similar mentality, meaning that if you are thinking about something like the FBI, get like another specialty like engineering or some kind of forensics or something like that, because they don't just want a criminal justice degree or a business degree and police officer experience. That's not enough for them. So you have to have a little bit different of an angle. So for me, that was what I was pushing for. And then when it was like, eh, you're not ready for what we're looking for. I transitioned to actually becoming a border patrol agent because back in 09, when I decided to go into that, actually 2008, because it took about six months to do the paperwork and get in, there was a big push mm-hmm. for border patrol. When I started, when I was going through the academy in the summer of 2009, I remember June 29th, 2009 was my first week there. We were pushing out so many agents that we were having two classes of 50 agents starting a week. And that was going on several months before I got there and probably for about a month and a half, maybe two months after I got there. So I remember I want to say President Bush, I believe he had signed some law or he approved some special funding for Border Patrol. It was it was it was madness, so to speak, because they were pushing out so many people. So I went from being a police officer that I went into Border Patrol, which was my next career in law enforcement. Okay. So what's some of the highlights from that? What did you uh, see and get to do while you were in the Border Patrol? Well, if anybody knows anything about the Border Patrol, it's a lot of chasing people at the border. (laughs) So I I, I was very fit. Um, I did a lot of running. I did a lot of jumping. Didn't do a lot of fighting, which is good. I want to say I did more fighting as a police officer than I did as Border Patrol, which which people don't think about it that way, but... A lot of depends on where you're at. Um, a lot of times, for me at least, I'm not built for fighting. Anyways, that's not really who I am. I don't like getting punched in the face, or I, it's just not me. And I and I, I accept I can accept that. So for me, right. it, it was more chasing and 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 not investigating, but kind of looking at different signs of deception, body language. But for me, it was cool. I got that. But the most significant part of my time in Border Patrol, at least as an agent, was I became a canine handler. So about 18 months into the role as a, as a regular agent, I, I was given the, the amazing opportunity to have a work dog. I had a Belgian Malinois. His name was Rigo. He was a 70-pound energetic beast. So we paired up very well. <laughs> um, so for me, that was my highlight as a Border Patrol agent as far as like the different things I could have done. I don't want to be on horse patrol. I don't want to ride ATVs. I didn't want to be on the Marine Patrol. I got into the role mm-hmm. I wanted to get into, which was canine. And anybody that's had a dog, man, it's it's an amazing experience. And I was able to enjoy it before I left Border Patrol. That's how that's I if if I was a Border Patrol, I might still be a canine handler. That's how much I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. I was a canine handler for the state of Missouri Bloodhounds. And um yeah, that was one of the okay. best times of my career. So, yeah, I absolutely know what you're talking about. So, how long did you stay mm-hmm. with the Border Patrol? I stayed with them. How long were you with them? Coincidentally, about four, four and a half years as well. And I laughed at it because okay. as I looked at my time in Border Patrol, I was like, all right, so you're going to stay four years. What, is this a trend? You stayed four years as a police officer. You stayed four <laughs> years as Border Patrol. Now, are you going to go to Federal Corrections, the BOP, and stay another four years? Not. Four years right. wasn't the plan for any of them. It's just the way the timing worked out. Yeah, yeah. Well, you were moving on. It's not like you were headed backwards or anything. You're moving up with each move. Um, tell me about your your first time in uh, federal prison because that's you can be in law enforcement. You can do a lot of stuff, but when you first walk in and hear that that grill slam behind you, that's a different world. What did you think then? <laughs> It's interesting you say that because a lot of people that's in law enforcement, I kind of took a backwards approach to getting to corrections. A lot of times you find people starting in the local jails, maybe the state prisons, and then becoming a, a patrol officer or a federal agent. For me, 
it did go a little backwards, but it went backwards for the right reasons. First, first and foremost, the reason I left Border Patrol wasn't because I disliked the agency. It wasn't that I was having any problems with, with a supervisor. It was, it was a family reason. I was in Laredo, Texas sure. with me and my wife at the time, and she became pregnant with my, with my son. So mm-hmm. for us, we understood the value of having family, raising a kid and being in Laredo away from all our family that was in Florida. We were like, no, this isn't going to work out. So to be quite honest, I didn't know what a bureau of prisons, I didn't know what a federal corrections was until May of 2012. And that was because one of my friends, actually, let me take that back. May of 2013 was when I found out about the bureau of prisons because one of our friends who's a marshal, he had actually worked for the BOP years mm-hmm. before he became a marshal. So he was like, hey, guys, you know, there's this thing called the Bureau of Prisons. You keep your federal time. You, you're able to transfer everything over. You don't lose that four years you already have in. And once I looked into it, there was actually an institution that was close to my ex-wife's um, parents' house. So once I went over there, it was actually um, FCC Coleman, which is um, in Florida, once yep. I realized how yep. close it was, it was about an hour drive. So for most of us that's worked in federal corrections of the BOP, an hour drive really isn't nothing because it's it's some of us, <laughs> some people drive more than that. I've never driven more than an hour at this point. Everywhere else I've worked, it's been 20 or 30 minutes less. But mm-hmm. I went from that transition. And what I realized is that corrections is actually amazing. But for me, it was completely different because as a police officer, you're out there with a gun. You're maybe dealing with one two people pretty pretty consistently you might go to a party or something like that or do crowd control but that's not every day and then obviously you have a weapon on you you have a t- i had a taser i had a baton or an ass mm-hmm. at the time uh, so you i had a lot of tools and the same thing with border patrol you're you're dealing with illegal aliens um in groups but even that it's wide open so you're right mike that first yeah. experience of walking into that prison was a little chilling um because although I was eight years in, educated, it, 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 do, it didn't prepare you for that feeling you get when you walk into that front door, you go through that sally port, you walk through, you see, you hear the gates closing behind you, and now it's you and hundreds of inmates. And then the institution mm-hmm. I started at was a high penitentiary, so that was even more elevated. It wasn't at, like I was at a minimum security institution or someplace that violence isn't common, so... You know, right, that first feeling, I was, I was, my heart was racing a little bit. I was getting a little nervous, but not nervous because I was in fear of the inmates. It was just something different because I had never experienced. So I was like, oh man, like, how do I handle this? And then obviously over time, right. it got over. But I know that initial feeling was like, oh crap, now it's not, now I'm in here. What next? And I've heard, I've talked to some other officers who have transitioned from police work to uh, corrections. And, you know, in corrections, we're dealing with people who are really good at manipulation and seeing through. So with your, even your personality and stuff, you feel naked, you know, and then you walk in and you've lost all your tools that you're used to having. So here's this another level of, it's just you, you get stripped down to just you and your verbal skills and your mind when you walk in a prison, uh, there's nothing hide, nothing to hide behind kind of, does that make sense? No, there, there, there isn't. You have to be you. The, the main tool you have is your brain at this point, and and your verbal judo. It's funny because, and I tell people now, I wish that everybody that gets into law enforcement, and if your ultimate goal is not to be in corrections, which is an amazing industry or part of law enforcement, mm-hmm. you should at least do something in the jail or corrections before you hit those streets, because all your only weapon, your only tool, your only resource is how well you talk to people. And you're talking to people right. that have already talked to law enforcement who knows how many times in their life. So it ain't like you're talking to Sally May that you go <laughs> to her house and it's the first time she's ever called the police. No, you're talking to people that have talked to a lawyer. They've talked to police investigators before. They've talked to a judge. Mm-hmm. They've talked to a probation officer. And now they're talking to you. So right. they've had a lot of law enforcement experience at some point, especially <laughs> in the, on the federal side. Most people that get in the federal prisons, it's not like they just didn't do anything. Like it's usually something that right. had to be involved. And then you get to that penitentiary level. And most people that are in penitentiaries, I always say they've either done 
one thing that's really, really bad, or they've done a lot of things that are really small. But it's <laughs> usually not their first rodeo coming to that level on average. Um, so because you don't just automatically right. qualify for a penitentiary. There are things that every, no matter if you're federal or state, that you have to do to get to that level. So it's definitely a different type of um, atmosphere. It's a different tool I had to use and really really bring out and it's been amazing being able, being able to use that tool for the past 10 years because it's allowed me to even communicate with more groups because of it yeah yeah absolutely so um corrections is one of those jobs where uh sometimes you can get lost you know um in the shift work and then when you begin there uh, just getting to know you a little bit I see the drive that's in you and, and the drive to do more and more. And you're always reaching out, trying to do something more. Um, so tell me about, as you went into corrections, uh, did you deal with the slowness, the pace, um, where you, uh, for me, it was somewhat the creativity. I didn't have the creativity that I could use at work. So that's why I had to reach outside of work in order to do some of that. Tell me your story about that as you've moved through corrections. So it is interesting, and for those that haven't worked corrections or are in it, it's ex- it can be extremely slow at times. And it's weird you say that. Well, you're like, well, I'm surrounded by anywhere from 120 to a couple of hundred inmates at a time. How can it be slow? Because once you have a system, once you have a routine, the inmates know and you know. And once you gain that respect from the inmates, they're going to let you do your thing for eight hours, 16 hours, however many hours you work that day. So... For mm-hmm. me, it was it was a little slow um, on a day to day basis, especially when I started out. But it was kind of cool because at the time I was in my last semester of my master's degree in business, and in that particular okay. course, it was a leadership course, and that was actually my it might have been my first time ever taking a a leadership course. Actually, you know what it was, and one mm-hmm. of the things that it taught me was that it talked about networking. I I had never dealt with networking ever in law enforcement before and even in any of my studies because it's not a common thing to talk about in law enforcement but you start going to these non-law enforcement industries and you realize how important networking is so for me early on i had a great correctional training officer a great field training officer his name's heath Pryor. um he's actually he's actually works in coleman right now great guy and it was one of the cool transitions because as I was learning about networking, I had someone that was actually good at it and he, and he took me under his wing and he was like, okay, this is what you want to do. Um, so for me, one of the very first things I was able to do was I was able to have a sit down with my current, with my word at the time. She's retired now, Tammy Jarvis, and she had an HR background. So yep, yep. she was extremely, she was extremely excited to find someone that wanted to push their career. So for me, and this was probably the first three months I had to sit down with her. I told her my aspirations. Um, it was a great conversation. She gave me a couple of different things to look at. Um, but one of the things she did, she challenged me not to just come to work and do nothing. She said, hey, always right. do more training. Always figure out how to promote yourself, market yourself. And for me, it quickly allowed me to the, to actually do that, Mike. Like It was actually kind of cool because although right. I was an officer starting out, I didn't stay there long. Because then an SIS job, which in the federal prison is a investigator position, came open, and within six months, yep. like by April of twenty twenty, uh, April of twenty fourteen, actually was promoted to that role. So I went from maybe being an officer for six to seven months, and uh, people want to verify it, they can, and I don't always talk about it until it's brought up. But yeah, I went. I was an officer for about six seven months. Then I went to investigations, and from there, boom, I was already in the game because. Anybody that's been any kind of mm-hmm. prison investigations, it never ends. It's just, it's just, it's just how fast it was. <laughs> then I went to become yeah. a lieutenant at a penitentiary, and obviously, anybody right. that's been any supervisor role in law enforcement, you know that's that's intense. Then I went on yep. being a over internal affairs at the next institution I worked at, which was intense. But then you're right, Mike. It, I, I, as I sat there, I was like, man. I feel like I need to be doing more. Like what, what, what am I not doing? Then COVID hit. Mm-hmm. Then I was sitting in my house and I, and I got another promotion at the institution running training. And I was like, what else can I do? Like, like I felt like I still wasn't like fulfilling my calling. Like I, I felt like I still wasn't doing enough. So 
that's when I started to get more involved in my speaking business, which I do a lot today. Mm -hmm. Um, but you're right. It, it, there was that level of hunger that stayed consistent throughout, throughout even the prison side, because I, you're right. There was always something more that I wanted to do. Sure. And I, I don't think people realize even at a penitentiary and, and I worked at several penitentiaries and they were rocking and rolling places. Um, you can have a fight every day, but as a correctional officer, that just becomes part of your day. That takes up 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. It takes up you know, 20 minutes and then you move on with your day. So there was always, you know, kind of the work me. And then there was the out of work me. And I was, so I was always reaching to find something to do out of work to keep my mind busy for the rest of those times. So you talked about your speaking. Um, tell me something about that. How'd you get into that? And, um, where's that taking you? Man, it's taken me so many amazing places. And for me, it actually started when I went from being an investigator to a lieutenant. One of the things that, uh -huh. that lieutenants do, or if you're non-federal, uh, you may be a sergeant or a corporal, is that you do speak. You actually do a lot of public speaking as a lieutenant. You don't really, we don't call it that, but you're doing conference calls, you're doing um, recalls, you're doing you're tra you're mm -hmm. doing different training classes as a lieutenant. And as I entered that role, at up to that point in my life which was, this was about 2015, I hadn't had any formal leadership training or not much, not, not at least on the, um, the agency side, any agency. Mm -hmm. And then I hadn't really had any public speaking training because really I, I, I had that fear of, oh, I'm never standing in front of people and speaking. But once I picked up that supervisory role, based on some of the stuff I already studied, I realized communication is going to happen. And I had to make a choice. Do I want to be a good communicator or do I just want to be someone that's just up there talking aimlessly? I chose the mm -hmm. less work on my communication. So for me, and it didn't happen right away. It still took me about a year to actually get into it. But my speaking abilities that were and that I realized I had started in about it started in February of 2016 when I joined Toastmasters. That's if you guys okay. have never heard of it, type in Toastmasters.org. I get no no kickbacks from them. I just I, I just love what their organization is about. But Toastmasters mm -hmm. is a International education program focused on public speaking and leadership skills. You don't pay much a mm -hmm. year for it, which is crazy, because um, I would pay a lot for what they offer. But that's actually where my speaking skills and my drive for speaking started. And then, you know what? I was like, you know what, Mike? Mm -hmm. I was like, I, I like the speaking stuff. I, You know what? I can see doing it. But I still didn't really have a path yet. So the next year, which was January, I want to, or excuse me, 2017, I want to say it was around February, March, a, a former coworker, Robert Melendez, he had started posting these really cool images of like him speaking and different quotes. And I was like, hey, Rob, like, what are you doing? Like, are you still a Border Patrol agent? Like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I joined this thing called the John Maxwell team. And I am a very curious person. I love learning. So for me, I went and sure. looked him up and I was like, oh, John Maxwell. I, I read one or two of his books in the past, but I really didn't know much about him. So what he has is he has a, a certification program that gives you the skills and the, the the data to be able to coach, train, and speak. So for me, I was so curious. And I obviously, one thing I got to tell everybody, things cost money. None of this was free on this side. Right. So I spent a right. couple of grand. And in... July of 2017, I got certified in his coaching programs, speaking programs and training. Mm -hmm. And it was so motivational. The one program I went to, I was like, you know what? I'm going to start a business in public speaking. And in October of 2017, I actually formed Michael Laidler LLC, which now I do business as Michael Laidler Unlimited as a speaker. But for me, that was the foundation of the speaking. Uh, really came from the working in the prison system and becoming a, a leader at least by title. Right. And I was like, I want to be a communicator, good communicator, not by title, but actual ability. Absolutely. And, and that's, that's got to help you at work as well as outside of work. Uh, just a little trivia note here. Um, we had a, a, a former federal correctional officer on, I think it's been about 20 episodes ago, Wally Long. And Wally is a national Toastmasters champion. Uh, so Toastmasters also has competitions yes. and, you know, if you know that that's a pretty big, uh, a pretty big title to get. And, uh, he's competed several times in that. 
Oh. Uh, I did Toastmasters many years ago uh, when I was very young uh, for about a year, and I think I got a lot out of it. You get to stand up and practice and speak in front of other people. So that that is a great organization if if you're looking into that. So tell me about John Maxwell. I mean, I've read the books, and I've seen um, – you know, that they hold that school and stuff. Well, just you know, don't go into all of it, you know, but what were some of the highlights of what you learned getting to do that? You know, it's funny because the John Maxwell program is so comprehensive that there's an analogy that I use. They give you so much information. It's like having a turnkey house, because if you say, Michael, hmm. I want to learn more about communication, Michael, I want to learn about intentional growing. Michael, I want to train my team on going, like fulfilling their potential. There's more than likely a John Maxwell program for it. And when I say that, okay. it's it's a completely designed program. It'll have a PowerPoint. It'll have a lesson plan. It even have speaking notes. So you can literally, I, I can go on his website, which I have lifetime access to as a paid member. And I can just go pull oh. that whole curriculum right now. You can say, hey, Michael. Hey, at, at noon, I need you to teach a four-hour block on leadership while focusing on these areas. And I'll see what programs are applicable. I can say, hey, Mike, which one which one sounds good to you? You'll say, oh, out of those 10 you just said, that one sounds good. I will pull the curriculum off, and I can teach it. So my biggest takeaway from the John Maxwell team was at, there's mm-hmm. a lot of things to take away from. But for the sake of time, the sake of purpose, for me, it's a turnkey sure. house for information. Like you can, it, it's so you don't have to sit there and say, oh, I got to create all this content, which I do on my own now yeah. for my stuff. But if you're a beginning speaker or you're looking at how to get into this industry, John Maxwell certification gives you all these tools. Obviously, it's his branded material. So if you tell someone, for example, I did a leadership program recently with a book called Put Your Dream to the Test. Obviously, you're about to buy okay. 30 of his books. Um, you're going to buy his facilitator guides. You're going to buy his master, um, his, his uh, participant guides. You're, he's going to provide the PowerPoint, uh-huh. but it's going to be still something. You're, he still that, that he still makes passive income, which is cool from it. But yeah. everything you use for, after that, it's all you. You just got to make sure you pay his his respect, and you say, "Hey, this is John Maxwell material." Don't take put your dream to the test by Michael Laidler. You can't do that. But if that's, <laughs> if you don't, like, most people don't care about most people like, Hey, I just need this leadership program. So for me, yeah. the biggest takeaway was it, it gave you so much information that, that you could just start teaching that same day. Right. Well, and I don't know that everybody realizes part of learning to be a good speaker is being able to uh, take that topic or that class and, and teach it mm-hmm. to different groups. You know, that that is one of the things you learn as you right. move into that. Um, and so that sounds like that, that's what they're allowing you to do is have not have to do the back work and bring your skills to the table, which is the speaking and the instructing and being in front of a class. So uh, I actually learned a lot of my You're skills right. from the Bureau of Prisons. Because you know as well as I do with annual training and all the training we do, uh, you may get snagged. If you're a good instructor, they're going to snag you and go, "Hey, you're teaching today at four, or, you know, at two <laughs> o'clock. Uh, you've got sixty people in here, yeah. uh, so you, you get a lot of that." So, at what point did you decide that? Um, I've got your book here, "Greatness Beyond the Badge: The Three Key Principles for Self Awareness" by Michael Laidler. Um, Tell me a little bit about your book and what uh, made you want to become an author. You know, <laughs> it's actually kind of funny because I opened my business in 2017. I had some speaking engagements in 2018. A lot of pro bono work, you know, trying to test the water, seeing what I was good at, what I what I wasn't mm-hmm. good. Because even working with the Bureau of Prisons, you know your audience. You know the material. You know what you're going to be teaching. But as an entrepreneur, you're going out to a whole new world. You don't, you, as an entrepreneur... You don't know who's going to like you and who doesn't like. So it's 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 a different type of battle. Once again, in the prison system or any organization or agency that you're working in, you know who's going to be there. You know, people have to show up because they it's a requirement as an entrepreneur. You have to learn mm-hmm. to bring people to you. And that's the thing, different things like marketing and speaking to the right person. So for 2018, that was a lot of what I did. And then when I took my promotion in 20 at the end of 2018 and 2019, I only spoke once professionally outside of the BOP in 2019. Mm -hmm. And then 
Um, COVID hit, which was 2020, 2021. I did no speaking at those two years. So out of a three-year period, okay. I spoke once. And it was the summer of 2021 where I was sitting around my house and I don't remember the day, but I, I was like, what am I doing? Like, why am I not using this skill that I've been working on for years to help other law enforcement officers out? Why am I not building people's leadership skills up in other industries? So I created a presentation. Initially, it was a presentation on self-awareness mm-hmm. because I looked at I looked at our climate of what was going on in law enforcement. Obviously, we had the George Floyd incident that happened not too long before that. And then I just saw our numbers going down because when COVID hit, if you had any, if you were on the fence about being outside or working from home, a lot of people realize they'd mm-hmm. rather work from home now. And that you can't do field work in law enforcement from home. Like you could do certain roles. That's right. obviously there's roles for that, but being around inmates, being around the citizens, you can't do it from a camera. You can't do it from your phone. You right. have to be out there. So our numbers started dwindling. And I started to realize all the pressures. And for me, like I said, I like I was just paying attention. So I thought, you know what, what can I bring to the table? And that's when I created my presentation on self-awareness. It was actually initially called the invisible law enforcement officer, the three key principles for self-awareness. And I was like, you know what? That's kind of okay. long. It's kind of it's kind of different. So I started doing the presentation um, kind of starting in 2022. And then I was listening to a podcast um, for a certain company that I was working with at the time. And mm-hmm. it was kind of cool because one of the guys came on there, a guy named Chandler Bolt from the self-publishing school. And he was like, I can publish your book in 90 days or less. Now, Remember, entering 2022, I had no intent on writing a book whatsoever. Like, that wasn't on Michael Laidler's radar. I was like, eh, okay. book writing. I like books. Doesn't mean I want to be an author like that. So in March of 2022, I heard his podcast, and I love challenges. As I've mentioned several times, I love learning new things. Mm-hmm. So I ended up reaching sure. out to their company. Obviously, there was a, 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 a I'm not going to even say a nominal fee. There was a fee. Because if I say nominal, you may think it was cheap. It was not cheap. It was <laughs> several, several thousands of dollars to kind of get that. So keep, sure. keep, let's keep it. If you want things done right, you do got to pay. It ain't free. Just like if you want to be a speaker, nope. you shouldn't be speaking for free. Not a lot. Um, so mm-hmm. in March of 2022, I took this idea, this concept, this presentation I had already been giving. And I said, you know what? Let me put it into the book. So Every morning for about 45 days, I woke up and I transcribed my book into Google Documents. And it was kind of mm-hmm. cool because I was truly focused and everything. And um, after those about 30 to 45 days, my, my transcript was ready. So from that point forward, I did all the other – well, they helped me with like the front cover, the Amazon stuff, the stuff you see right now, putting it in the book. And on July 26th of 2022 was actually when I published the book on Amazon. So for me, initially becoming an author wasn't the number one thing I wanted to do. But since I've okay. done it, it's been so amazing, Mike. It's been so cool. Like you have your book, you know how it feels. Like being able to mm-hmm. leave that legacy no matter what. Like I have a book. I mean, literally, like I, I don't have to write anything else. And that book can end up in a shelf in 2050 because it's already out there. Right. I don't know if it will, but the fact that I put it out there, like I put my thoughts – on the paper. And for me, and this is kind of a buzzword, but I love to use it. It was transformational for me because it gave me the confidence that I could write better. It gave me the confidence that I can reach people that I may never reach in any other manner. And I've even been able to give the books out to different agencies. And when I say give, sell, let me clarify, but I've been able to sell the books to other agencies. Right. There's even been <laughs> one state agency that bought it, bought 800 copies because they wanted all their staff to wow. have one. So it's cool to have that out there. So for me, just having the book was uh, even heightened my self-awareness because it made me learn even more about it. Like, cause I was like, you know what, if I put this information in the book, it has to be, it can't just be my opinion. It has to be my stories, mm-hmm. but I want to make sure I have the facts to go with whatever I'm talking about. So for me, having the book, publishing it, bringing it out, it's, it's been life changing for me. Absolutely. That's great. Well, I've read your book and I, I do enjoy it. Um, you know, you talk about um, the self-awareness aspect. And one of your little, um, I don't know if you call it a, a, a drill or, or a practice thing, but I found it really interesting and I found it current. And that was the selfie mirror method. 
you know. Uh, so tell them a little bit about the selfie mirror method. I think that's a, a good way. I used to stand in front of a camera when I was learning to speak, and I would record myself and then go back and look at it, which is hard to do. It really is to look at yourself, you know, doing that. But um, tell them about your little method there of get, gaining some self-awareness. So for me, there, there's a couple of aspects for the selfie uh, method that I, that I like. Um, the, the premise behind the whole concept of that method is identifying yourself as a person. For me, that was, that was kind of the driving force because a lot of us identify ourselves as a title. Like you will say, oh, you'll mm -hmm. meet somebody in public and say, oh, I'm Officer Mike Cantrell. I'm Captain Mike, Lan uh, Mike Cantrell. I'm Lieutenant Michael Laitler. Well, for me, it mm -hmm. was more of how do I flip the narrative? So what I was telling people to do, um, at least in part of that, that selfie method, and, and as I built it was take your phone, look at yourself, and identify yourself as your first and last name, the name you were born with, then your title. And it's crazy how that psychological method really changes how you think about yourself. Because before, when you say your title, that means that's your image. But I wanted people right. to start like forcing their image to be them. Like I wanted them to say, you know what? I'm Michael Laylor. I'm Mike Cantrell. I'm Joe Smith. And then I do this. Like I don't, I, I want right. people to flip it. And that's kind of where that came from. And it, it was kind of cool because when I first started doing it, like I've done it in a few conferences and a few different trainings, people are like, huh, I know I, I always introduced myself. And now you, I find myself listening for people to say, Oh, I'm sheriff this. And I wait, 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 wait. I'll say, wait. And they're like, wait, what? I was like, I, I want you to identify yourself as your first and last name. Then tell me you're a sheriff. Don't, don't tell me that sure. your, your title first, because you get too lost in that. Because at some point we all lose our title, our work title. It's, whether you retired, resigned, transfer, I can tell you three different agencies, multiple positions. That title I had before, I left. Same thing with you, Mike. Mm -hmm. You know, A, what your title I was do. what you were when you were with the Bureau of Prisons, when you were with the state um, corrections over there. That's what you were as a title. But who you are is who mm -hmm. you are throughout your whole life. The same Michael Laylor that loved that O.J. Simpson uh, chase back in – 1994 is the same Michael Laitler that loves that chase even talking about in 2023. I'm that same person. <laughs> I've had a lot of titles, good and bad titles. It depends on what inmate or citizen I was around. I had a lot of titles after that too, but <laughs> it was definitely something that um, I really wanted people to emphasize when it came to their identity. I wanted people to relate to themselves first before they related to any industry or any organization, because to me, that's important. It is important. And I'm just... I guess I'm just learning it, and that's part of the reason why it, it hit me so hard because, you know, not only in the Bureau of Prisons but the federal government and law enforcement, we tend to introduce ourselves with a resume. We don't just introduce ourselves. I mean, it's always, hey, I worked at, you know, I started at Leavenworth as an officer. I went here as a lieutenant, and then I was a captain, you know, and uh, retirement has really thrown it back in my face a little bit because um, – I don't have those titles anymore, and I was used to having a title, um, but we tend mm -hmm. to do that a lot, so I think that's why that touched me in this book is because I'm actually working through that, trying to, uh, you know, and I've just kind of changed, I guess. Now I'm podcast host and author, but uh, um, that is something I've been looking at and doing that that self-reflection, but I think that's a great little, to be able to hold that phone up and look back at yourself because we're so used to taking pictures with the phone um, of selfies mm -hmm. and things that are going on to hold that phone up and you be the only one in the picture. Look back in your own eyes and see who you are it is a very interesting exercise uh, that I found out of your book. Um, you know, you talk about a lot of communication and stuff, um, listening skills, which is, uh, you know, New correctional officers are always asking me. I get emails, you know, pretty regularly. Hey, what what can I do? You know, how can I uh, be a good rookie? And it all comes in corrections and in law enforcement. It comes back to right. listening. Uh, but once you learn to listen, whether it's at work or whether it's outside of work, you learn so much more about the people around you. Um, and so I think that's an important part of your book. 
So talk to me a little bit about, um, you've been doing some speaking engagements that are just amazing, uh, you know, and, and tell us a little bit about what you're doing now and, and how that's going. Well, one of the cool things about writing a book is that you want to practice what you preach. So some of the things I talk about in my book, first and foremost, is getting a mentor, getting a mentor in multiple areas of your life, because mentors have been where you're trying to go already. So for me, I've had some really great mentors, um, whether it's being a speaker, whether it's being a father, whether it's being whatever you want to call it. And some of these mentors have showed me, have, have laid a foundation, have laid a path for me. And they was like, hey, if you do this, this, and this, it'll help you walk down a lot smoother. So some of these mentors have showed me how to be a successful speaker. Now, there's a lot of things I still work on. And when I say successful, that just means I'm, I'm getting speaking engagements consistently. It's not easy. I can tell you um, yesterday, I probably spent three hours, give or take, throughout the day um, just looking for speaking engagements, reaching out to people, telling people, reading emails, people saying, no, we don't want you. People saying, oh, we do want you. So being all over the place. So for me, as, as I've grown my speaking engagements, and I, I know, and you're right, I have been doing very well the last 18 months just because I've been putting in that work. I mean, what people don't understand is entre- sure. being an entrepreneur, having a business, it's not the government. It's not the federal government. It's not the state government. It's not the municipal government. You have to go out there and work for all of these different things. You have to be willing to go out there and sacrifice sleep. One of the things, I don't know, you guys don't know, but I was telling Mike before we started, I said, I'm on three hours of sleep right now. Not because I wanted to, it's just because I was trying to I was trying to finish an online course. I was working on a flyer for a future speaking engagement. I'm going out of the country mm-hmm. tomorrow. So being an entrepreneur, you have to also have that that work ethic because nobody's just coming up to you, especially right. out the gate. I don't care how good of a speaker you are. I don't care what your title is in the government, um, at your prior organization. It doesn't really matter. If you're not going out there consistently, you're not going to get consistent work. You may get one here and there that falls in your lap, but that's not going to keep the uh, mortgage paid every month. That's not going to get your mm-hmm. car no. That's not going to put groceries and all those people still ask for money. So being that, that, right. that speaker, um, for, for me, it's definitely taken a lot of work, a lot of effort. But just like the book, it's been refreshing. It's allowed me to kind of have a hobby, which is kind of weird. People are like, what one of your hobbies? I'm like, well, public speaking. And they look at me like, really? Like most people, we don't even want to do this. I said, well, for me, it's been refreshing because I also get an intrinsic reward from it. Like you said, I love the fact that people are reaching out to you, Mike, by email and they're asking you different questions on communication. Because for me, when I speak and I see that look in their face or they come to me later and say, hey, you know what, Michael, we really appreciate appreciate the presentation. Even if it's one person out of 300, that feels good to me. Because I'm like, you know what? I at least sure. I was able to at least impact one person. So the speaking side and the ability to communicate is an amazing feature to have. So long story short, yes, when it comes to speaking, um, I have I've had a lot of opportunities and it's been a lot of work. But each one for me mm-hmm. is fulfilling. And don't worry, I still have fear. I was speaking in another country last last um, week. I was in Central Asia, mind you guys. I've never been to Central Asia before. I didn't even know that my <laughs> speaking career would lead me to that, but I had mentors, I networked, I did what was in my book, as I as I suggest to do, and mm-hmm. it led me to Central Asia to speak to a group of delegates, and they only spoke Russian. And the cool part about it, or the interesting wow. part about it, was I not I don't speak Russian. There was translators in a room, so I don't want y'all saying, "Well, Michael, well, how many languages do you speak?" I speak English <laughs> and a little bit of Spanish. That's that. And when I say Spanish, right. it's usually when I travel because it's part of survival mode. <laughs> so for right, me, right, right. So for me, the um, the speaking really showed me even more about myself because I mean, like I said, I always have a little bit of fear. I mean, I remember the first hour of that presentation, and I know for me, usually when I speak, especially publicly, usually my back sweats. I know this. I, I and mm-hmm. I've adjusted to this. Like if I feel s- sweat going down my back, it's normal for me. I don't want it, but I can't stop it, which is fine. <laughs> which is fine at this point. Right. But it's just part of my the way my body. We all have something that we should react to, or that our body reacts to. So for me, but it was cool because I I, I can see through their eyes. I could see through their body language that they were dialed in. They were paying attention to what I was talking mm-hmm. about. And, 
I haven't had one guy, and this is only a small group of 25, he actually reached out to me um, saying, hey, I want to learn more about this leadership, some of the stuff you taught about. So for me, and being a speaker, um, although it's a lot of work, it's very fulfilling. And I know, my, I know Mike, you, you definitely feel the same way because you're in retirement mode. I mean, yeah. you don't have to do anything else. Obviously, your energy and what you want to bring to the table won't let you, but speaking is definitely something. And you could, even if you guys want to call it speaking, instructing. Whatever term you want to use, it's all mm-hmm. it's all the same. If you're standing in front of somebody sure. speaking, that's public speaking. Let's just let's just move 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 take that off the table. So it's definitely been fulfilling, and being a professional speaker has allowed me to go a lot of different places. Um, this year, I want to say because yeah. I do got to navigate and balance a full time job. I want to say I've traveled eight times this year so far, um, which, like I said, having a full time and doing that has been a balance and. Um, two of those trips have been out of country speaking engagements. So uh, the other six or seven have been within the United States. Excellent. Congratulations on that. Um, I think one of the fallacies about public speaking for those of you that are getting into it, Michael touched on it. You know, I, I teach all the time and I'm speaking, uh, pretty regular around the country and people think, well, you, you are not scared. I'm just as scared now as I was when I first started. The only difference is <laughs> I learned how to control <laughs> what yeah. you see when I'm up there. Uh, but mm-hmm. uh, I'm still nervous. I'm still wondering the whole time. You know, I can't tell you the number of times I've went and spoke or, or taught a two-day class. And, and I get done and I'm like, did they get it? You know, cause especially law enforcement. I'm, I'm going to tell you something about law enforcement. You guys can sit there with a blank stare for two days <laughs> and not give me any feedback on stage. <laughs> so I'm always wondering, yeah. and then you'll walk out of class and they'll all walk up to you and, you know, here's a patch, here's a coin. Thank you for what you do. Really got something out of your class. And I'm like, I didn't even know I did it well, you know, so. You didn't say nothing. <laughs> no. <laughs> so if you're getting into public speaking, don't think that you're going to have this point where you're no longer nervous. Uh, it's mm-hmm. learning to control those nerves and learning to give that good class and, and engage with people. And I, I think that's the best part of it, isn't it? Um, the number of people, correctional officers, law enforcement officers that I get to go out and meet is just phenomenal these days. I mean, several hundred a year, different people and different stories and, and different backgrounds. And it's just, that's the rewarding part for me is that connection. How about you? Not your man. I tell people, and that's, and I think that's part of the therapeutic side of, of, of the speaking yes. because you're right. Like, like I spoke to like, okay. So back to the trip I had last week, um, And if this, I don't know when this is going to air, but let's say the trip I had in the beginning of August. The first day Mm -hmm. I was there, we did something called a cultural day. So the delegates and another about 20 of us, we went horseback riding. I don't ride horses, Mike. That is not Michael Laidler. Michael (laughs) Laidler does not sign up to ride horses. I I, I don't fear them. I'm just not excited about them. Like, I've never had any negative issues, but in 38 years of my life, that was my second time horseback riding. Second time. Oh wow. I mean, I did fine. I didn't fall off. I mean, I had a good time, but those experiences, like, I will remember that. And it all started because of public speaking. If I wasn't a public uh-huh. speaker, I wouldn't have been in that group to go on that event. And then meeting the people, the culture, the different foods. Um, and that's even different foods domestically. I mean, I and Mike, I don't know how many places you lived, but one of the things that I grew to love, which I didn't know I would like, was crawfish. I didn't know about crawfish until mm-hmm. I moved to Louisiana years ago. I, in Florida, right. we have crawfish, and other people call them craw daddies. Depends on what part of the, the country you're in. I would have never known about that. <laughs> but through some of these speaking engagements, I I love the go because the first thing I'm like, take me to your local restaurant. I want what the locals eat. Yep. I want to go. If you guys are known for hot dogs, hey, I want to go get that hot dog from that stand. If you're known for ribs, hey, I want to go get ribs from your favorite place. But that comes through public speaking mm-hmm. and, and being able to kind of expand and go into different areas. I know, Mike, you said you've been on the road for a couple of weeks now. I hope you got to eat at some of these random places because it's cool. It, oh, yeah. it's, it's like you're getting a, you're getting paid to travel, meet people, and learn new experiences. And then obviously when you vacation, like I'm mm-hmm. taking my vacation out of country for a week, I'm going to learn that as well. But on the professional speaking side, 
most of your speaking engagements, especially if you grow, even if you go for five, if you grow five percent for a speaker, you're going to have to leave your current city. There's going to be no matter what. Mm-hmm. If you want to do any kind of expansion, you're going to move and not move. You're going to travel outside of your local driving area. So, if you're right. looking at being a speaker, you're looking at learning different areas. You're le- you're you're excited about learning different people. That's one of the unwritten or unspoken um, like benefits. You're just going to meet people because mm-hmm. that's just part of the business. Yeah, absolutely. One of my little uh, tips or tricks about traveling. So there's a TV show called uh, Diners, Diners, yeah. Dives, and Drive-Ins, I think yes. it's called. Yes, I so love when go I go, yes. when I go to a new city, <laughs> when I go to a new city, I bring that up and I go back through their map. And I'm always looking because he picks out some pretty off-the-road places to go eat. And uh, you'll get some Oh, he's finding the local places, too. He's, fi- he's finding the local places or yeah. where the, the good chefs have been or the good. So, yeah, I was going to oh, yeah. say, yeah, that is a place I check as well. If the locals don't or if they're like, eh, we don't really know, I'll, I'll pull up that website quickly. Because you're right, the food's been amazing in yeah. all those places I've gone to. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, I know you got to get on the road today, but uh, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm gonna w- when you get back, I want to get together and and, and I want to pick a topic, and and you and I talk about a a couple of topics. And uh, now that we've learned about okay. you, but uh, tell these guys where uh, where they can find out more information about you, or and where they can contact you. Absolutely. So. For me, and before I say it, Mike, I will tell you that, and you guys, mind you, I, me and Mike have just been started talking the last couple of months or so. I love your 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 take on the in person podcast at events. I loved it so much that when I go to a conference in September, <laughs> I'm going to try it out. I actually talked to the conference planner. I was like, "Hey, you know, I was talking to a, a, a friend and acquaintance, and we we're talking about like having like live podcasts at the events." And he was like, "We've never mm-hmm. done that before, but you know what? Bring your bring whatever you have and let's try it." So, Mike, I do want to thank you for right. that. I want to thank you publicly for that as well, because for all those listening, if you've, if you've heard Mike or you kind of see what he's doing, those public podcasts are kind of cool because it's not the norm. It's not what people are used to. So if yeah. you see him at a conference, make sure you reach out to him and say, hey, do you have your equipment with you so we can do a live podcast? Because I think it's just a cool concept because a lot of us small business owners don't think about that, but social media and mm-hmm. and being on radio being on radio is actually old school i mean i i those hand radios i think that's what they call them <laughs> people have been doing those for decades right it's just now we're more digital mm-hmm. so so yeah sorry so i just want to give you a quick shout out because it popped into my mind I appreciate when, that when we were talking about that and doing it just, sorry guys i get excited three hours of sleep i know uh, i've only had water in this two bottles of water <laughs> that's it guys i know hyped um but for me if people are looking for me my favorite platform right now is linkedin I do a lot of posting there, and you can just find me at mm-hmm. Michael Laitler. That's the main area. Obviously, my website talks about what I do, doesn't really show everything because websites only show so much. Um, and that's MichaelWayLaitler.com. Right. I have a YouTube channel. That's Michael Laitler as well, where I post videos weekly about different leadership, different self-awareness, as well as I have a podcast that I put on there as well. And then obviously, my email is Michael at MichaelALaitler.com. So any of those areas, you can reach me. If you want my cell phone number, you can definitely reach out. Um, I don't mind any of that, but I definitely want to make sure we connect at some point. Obviously, maybe me and Mike can bring a, this podcast to wherever you're located at, and we can do a live on there with sure. you as our third guest or something like that. But yeah, to reach me, LinkedIn, email, my website, or all viable options. Well, that sounds great. Um, thank you so much for coming on the prison officer podcast. Um, I know there's a lot of people are going to enjoy this, this episode and and getting to learn a little bit about you and, and, and hearing about the good work you're doing out there, because I think it's good for the correctional officers, the prison officers out there to see, uh, it was good for me to look at people when I was there and know that there was life outside of that, Mm -hmm. you know, eight, 16 hours I spent working in, in seg so um there's plenty to do out there guys uh, uh grab the reins learn some public speaking join toastmasters you know there's uh you can go however far you want to go and uh, michael proves that so thank you very much and uh, we'll talk at you soon bye right. thank you mike i would like to take a minute to thank one of our sponsors that make the prison officer podcast possible omni rtls is a company that i've been working with for the last year I am proud to be part of this team of correctional professionals 
who have developed the best real-time locating system on the market today. With Omni's real-time location technology, you automatically know the accurate locations and interactions of all inmates, staff, and assets anywhere in your correctional facility, and you have this information in real time. Omni is cutting-edge software for today's jails and prisons. It is the only way to monitor every square inch of your facility while still being PREA compliant. Go to www.omnirtls for more information and to make your facility safer today. That's www.omnirtls.com. If you enjoy these podcasts, the best way to support the Prisoner Officer Podcast is to share these episodes with your friends or, or family on social media. Let me invite you to visit www.theprisonofficer.com. If you haven't already, check out the Prison Officer Podcast on Facebook and click that little follow button. Or leave us a message, or better yet, leave us a review. And if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, Google, or Spotify, please click the subscribe button. Until next time, I'm Mike Cantrell. Watch your back, and please take care of each other out there behind those walls.